Amen. Here in 1 John chapter 4, I want to dial in on the first verse here. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Now, I want you to think about this. John is writing to those that are already saved by faith in Jesus. And he's warning them, don't believe everything you hear. He's telling them to test the things that they hear. Be careful of what you hear. Try the spirits before you believe everything that you hear. Now, we live in a day where they have what's called fake news. You guys know what I'm talking about? And it's funny that the government indoctrinated news, I mean, CNN lies to you, and they're going to tell you, oh, we fact-checked it, and if you don't believe it our way or what the World Health Organization says, then it's fake news. I mean, they're the ones. They're fake news, right? Uh, they are not the standard of truth. I want to tell you, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Holy Bible, that is our standard of truth. And we live in a day when what is true and what is right they want to tell you it's all up for debate and you can decide whatever you want and you can be whatever you want you can say you're a, 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 a different gendered uh, what, animal for you know I mean things are getting weird and the truth is in question uh, and so here when he says beloved believe not every spirit but try the spirits I want to talk about trying the spirits today and what that means for us Christians today, what that looks like. And I want to talk about the spirit that's behind the Bible. The spirit that's behind the Bible. Did you know that the Bible has a ghost writer? Did you guys know that? Who knows what I'm talking about? Now, if you were in the Sunday school hour this morning... You heard Brother Luke tell us that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This Bible has God's Spirit behind it. Now in the Bible it uses the word ghost in two ways. Either when a man dies and he gives up the ghost, his spirit leaves the body, absent from the body, present with the Lord, or when it refers to the third part of the Godhead called the Holy Ghost. He's called the Holy Spirit. Uh, interestingly in the Bible, it doesn't call every other spirit a ghost. It only refers to the Holy Ghost. Now, if you've grown up in American culture, you think of ghosts. You may think of uh, Casper or Ghostbusters or any other number of worldly influence, right? Uh, well, in the Bible, a ghost was you give up your spirit or it's referring to the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Now, you have a spirit and a soul inside of your body. They will last forever. Amen. The problem we get into is sometimes people say things that are not right. They're not correct. Now, we have many different versions of the Bible. As we're having a month focused on the Scriptures and our scriptural growth, I want to talk about that, which Bibles have which spirit behind it. But then I also want to deal with you. And listen, every preaching ought to start right here in the mirror. And let me deal with me. Because as a human being, I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. I have my own spirit. Now that I'm saved, I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm commanded to follow that spirit and be led of that spirit and to walk in that spirit. And when I fail as a human being, I'm following my flesh or my own spirit. There ought to be an application there of try the spirits to see what spirit you're of sometimes because sometimes we say and do things that are not of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you if you're saved. We do it of our own prideful, selfish spirit. So I want to deal with both of these issues this morning. And I want to start with the Bible. Again, in verse 1, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Did you know there are many false prophets gone out into the world? Did you know there are fake preachers and there are fake newscasters? Well, I mean, we're really in trouble with the people we count as authority. Your children, if you let them, if you uh, give them one of these devices, this becomes their prophet. They can get on any manner of social media and it will teach them, it will tell them, it will guide them, it will give them morality and spiritualism and all these things and wh whoever they see on there becomes their prophet. I really do believe that there is a conspiracy of prophets, of 
false prophets. We see this in the Old Testament where uh, there was a lying spirit that came from, so an evil spirit, a, a devil, filled the mouth of a prophet and he led the bad guys into war so God could kill them. They were led by this spirit. Now we live in a time where Satan is trying to deceive the world. Well, how does he do it? Well, if Satan is the father of lies, and it says that he comes but for to kill, to steal, to destroy, he wants to wreak havoc in your house and in your life, how does he do that? Uh, does Satan knock on your door personally? Because you're that great of a Christian, you're on his top ten. Well, I doubt it. And I would say probably not even mine. He has his uh, minions. That's a, uh, that means a spirit, right? So here's where the error comes from. Satan sends a devil a false spirit, a lying spirit, an evil spirit, a familiar spirit, a seducing spirit. Uh, we also call them demons. So here's where the lies and the false prophecies come from. The devil sends a false spirit, an evil spirit. And that evil spirit will possess and inhabit and lead a false prophet. Now a false prophet is somebody that is willingly working wickedness. They know who God is and they hate God. They know who God's children are and he, they hate them. So it comes from Satan to, a, to an evil spirit. From an evil spirit to a false prophet. Then a false prophet will then deceive and manipulate followers. I really believe that a lot of people, they're saying things that they've learned from a false prophet, and they're just uh, an unsuspecting follower that's repeating something that's not true. So when he says in this verse that to try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, uh, there are many things that go from Satan to an evil spirit, from an evil spirit to a false prophet. Then from a false prophet, it comes down into an unsuspecting follower who just gobbles it up and they believe everything and they don't check it out. Well, I want to empower you, Christian, and help you to try the spirits to see whether they're of God. And I want to apply this primarily to the Bible this morning. Uh, let's read the first four verses. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. This is important. This is the litmus test. Verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, even now already it is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Here's the litmus test. There are false prophets out there, and there's false religious leaders and false newscasters. And what are they going to say? God didn't come in the flesh. It wasn't God dwelling with us. They're going to say Jesus isn't God. Somebody that says Jesus isn't God, they've got a problem with God. If they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. If they don't believe it's God that paid for their sins, then they're not saved. Jesus wasn't just a great prophet. Jesus wasn't just a smart guy that started a revolution. No, no, no. He is your God, your Creator. He's your Savior and your Redeemer. If you would go to Acts chapter 17. Go to Acts chapter number 17, please. Jesus is God. Now listen, there are many false prophets gone out into the world. We're told to try the spirits. There is a pattern of what they're going to change. And these couple of simple verses we just read tell us that the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is under attack. They'll say that the Son of God is not God. He was just a good prophet. They will say uh, that we are not saved by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Atonement, His payment for our sin. They'll say you have to bring your own works or you have to pray a special prayer, or light a candle, or give a donation, or get somebody else to pray on your behalf, or get baptized. They're going to add to salvation somebody else's works. So the, the characteristics of every false prophet is the attack on the deity of Jesus Christ and the attack of His payment for sin. Every cult out there 
wants you to not trust the Son of God. They'd rather you believe in their leader, if you will. Uh, uh, Islam, as an example. Islam, you know, Muhammad, at about 600 years after Jesus, he, he was um, uh, in a cave, and he was choked by a demon. He said it was a devil. He thought it was a demon. He said, this is an evil spirit. This devil said, I want you to read something. And he says, I can't read. I can't read. I'm illiterate. Th this is the historical account that the Muslims teach. I can't read. I'm illiterate. I don't know, right? Uh, well, his wife, who was 15 years older than him, and her cousin was a Jesuit general, uh, she took him to him, to the Jesuits, and he said, oh, no, 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 that wasn't a devil. No, 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 that was an angel, and you're a prophet of God now. He wants you to have a special message. Muhammad himself said, I'm possessed with a devil. A devil attacked me. He tried to choke me. And then he was lied to by these lying spirits. And in the Quran, in their holy books that they write, you know what they say? Well, they say, Jesus is not God. And you can't uh, pay for sins by what Jesus did. You have to pay for it by yourself. Islam is a wicked, false religion. And it's evidence because of what we saw earlier in 1 John 4, that they don't confess that Jesus is the Christ, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, didn't come in the flesh. In fact, all your other Bible versions delete that verse. They delete that portion of the verse. How about Mormonism? It used to, they used to be called uh, the Mormonites. The Mormonites. Okay, the Mormons started by Joseph Smith. He was running from the government. He had been arrested over 40 times. Joseph Smith had been arrested for deceiving and scamming people, for being a stone-seeing person. He would, he would put a, a, glass, a piece of glass or a stone in a hat and then say, oh, I see your future. Or he'd say, ooh, I think there's some treasure on your land. Pay me and I'll walk around and tell you where to dig. Joseph Smith was a swindler. His mom was into witchcraft. His dad was into Freemasonry, which is witchcraft, okay? Uh, he, he was raised up in these false religions. And Joseph Smith, while he was running from arrest, he was in the woods and the angels spoke to him. Some spirits came to him. He claims it was the angel Moroni. I call it m m moron, but anyway, moron I. <laughs> anyway, uh, he says he got this special message and he was led to a special golden Bible in the woods and he dug it up and it was so special. It was a language nobody else could read except for him and nobody else was allowed to look at it and he secretly translated all these other things. Now, now a couple things about Joseph Smith. I've got two things here. Let me present my evidence as you would in court, right? Uh, most of your Mormon kids riding around, this is what they have. This is a really fat Bible. You say, what do you got there? They'll say, oh, it's a King James Bible. I've got it. Well, what else is in here? Well, it's got the, uh, well, here, let's just read it. This isn't just the Bible. It's the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, uh, a, a dictionary. And then in the very back, it says the Joseph Smith Translation. I want you to know if you ever see one of these kids come by on a bike and they've got this big fat one, in the back is the Joseph Smith translation. I have an entire copy of the Joseph Smith translation right here. He called it the inspired version. There is some wicked, perverse doctrine in this Bible. Now, Joseph Smith, in his own words, he spake to a spirit. Now, we're, what are we called to do? Are we called to try the spirits, right? Let's try something. I want everybody to say with me at the same time, try the spirits. Ready? Try the spirits. Let's do that one more time. Try the spirits. Okay, so if you get a dream and an angel comes to you and he says, hey, I got news. I got something for you to do. I, uh, you're special. I'm going to use you. You should try the spirits. Well, Joseph Smith wasn't saved and he was into witchcraft. And this spirit told him some things that he was going to add to the scriptures. And he ended up saying that Jesus isn't really God because everybody's a God and you will become a God whenever you die. And if you're a good Mormon, you can go on and have your own planet, just like a Kolob and Mormon. I mean, there's some weird stuff about Mormonism. And you know what he came to is this result that Islam has, that it's okay to take, uh, that if you die the right way as a good Mormon, just as the Muslims would say, you go to heaven and get a bunch of virgins and you repopulate your own planet with spirit babies. This is bizarre stuff. It's almost like it comes from the same Spirit, which is not the Holy Spirit. There's a ghost writer 
to this Joseph Smith translation. It's an evil, lying spirit. It's Satan himself. He was possessed. You say, what about the Seventh-day Adventists? Because they're all actually tied together. They came out of the Campbellite movement in the 1800s. This is the Queer Word Bible. I'm sorry, Clear Word Bible. There is a lot wrong in this Bible. There are some things really wrong. This is what the Seventh-day Adventists claim as their Bible. And guess what? It's the same story. Through the influence of spirits, they came and revealed things. They get new doctrine. So this uh, Clear Word Bible, uh, for those that don't know, the Seventh-day Adventist was started by Ellen G. White. And she said she received visions of bright lights. And she had a spirit guide that was a well-dressed young man. He was noble. And he would lead her to other spirits that would give her these divine revelations about the end times and what the angels mean and all sorts of crazy things. That, that the return of Christ has already happened, but it was figurative and in heaven. She came out with some very bizarre doctrine. Uh, the descriptions of the people that were part of it says that she would just shout or scream or laugh like laughing hysterically. I mean, she was full of hysteria, and yet she was uh, low breathing, and all of a sudden she'd have super great strength. In her own account, she claims to have held out a really heavy Bible. I forget how heavy she said it was. Hold, held it out in her arm for you know 20 minutes or something, and, and I'm paraphrasing there. But I just, she just held it out and prophesied and gave these new words and new doctrines no one had ever heard of. And you know what the result was? Well, you're not atoned, you're not saved, your sins aren't forgiven by Jesus. Of course you have to keep the Sabbath and don't eat meat and all sorts of other bizarre doctrines that came from the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Their doctrine directly contradicts the Bible. Ellen G. White herself even made the claim that Jesus didn't die for the sins of the whole world. She said that some of the sins will be put on Lucifer and he will redeem, he'll pay for the sins in hell. He's like a co-redeemer. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry, the devil didn't pay for any of my sins. He didn't pay for any of yours. It's only by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what the Seventh-day Adventists are teaching is of an evil spirit. It's a lying spirit. This is very important. We've been told to try the spirits. Help me out. What are we told to do? Try the, Try the spirits. When somebody comes to you and says, man, I've got a story for you. You say, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Let's try the spirits and see if it's Christ honoring or if it's of a selfish, evil, wicked spirit. This is very important. Seventh-day Adventists are also related to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Who's met a JW? This is their updated version. There's, a, there's still a lot of weird things in, the, in these Bibles. This is called the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. I call it the New World Order Bible, okay? There's a lot of problems with it. Uh, the Jehovah's Witness was started by Charles Taze Russell. And uh, Charles Taze, he was kicked out of his church in Philadelphia because he was teaching the adult Sunday school class that there is no real hell. It's all just figurative. There is no punishment, which means there's no right or wrong. They caught wind of it and they said, look, buddy, you can't teach that here. You're out. So he's at home the next Sunday. And a bright light shines and overwhelms him and a spirit comes and gives him a new message. Go figure. I mean, are you starting to see a pattern here? Yes. Are you starting to see a pattern with all of these false religions? God spoke to him and gave him a new revelation. Jesus isn't God. He's just Michael the archangel. And of course you have to do works to go to heaven. Maybe if you're lucky. Again, polluting, perverting the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and taking away from the finished work of Jesus the atonement of our sins. Now you're in Acts chapter 17. I want you to see this. Look at verse number 11. Acts 17, verse number 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and, look at this, searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. You say, how can I try the spirits to know whether it's of God or a lying spirit? I'll tell you how. Be a Berean Christian. We're talking about the Bereans here. They were more noble. Why? It says because they searched the Scriptures daily. That's our job. That's our duty. Uh, Brother uh, Luke read it for us earlier that the holy men of God spake 
as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. How do we try the spirits? Well, we know what this says, and we know what's of God, and then we can compare it when somebody comes to you with a message, is it true? Uh, if you would, go back to 1 John chapter 4, where we started, 1 John chapter 4. And I want to talk about one other category of Bible, in a sense. In 1 John chapter 4, again, verse number 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There are many false prophets out there. And listen, if the devil wants to get in your heart and in your home and in your mind and in your set of beliefs, what he would do is pervert the Bible. Because frankly, I don't believe that any one of you would go down to the bookstore and buy a uh, book of Satan to see if there's any truth in there. I don't think you would. However, if he could pollute and pervert and delete from a Bible a source that you think is from God and change the Scriptures and delete the truth, then it's like he's knocking one of your legs out from under you. I walked up yesterday, I ran into these kids and... Um, at our old church building, I pulled up to unlock the door. Somebody was taking those old pews. And there's three kids sitting out there. And uh, they're laying around. And this kid, they both, two of them had Bibles. It was neat. And the other one, he had it in his heart. I preached the gospel to him. They helped me move a piano. Uh, it was neat to talk with them. Uh, but the, the kid, I said, where are you at? Okay, what are you reading? Okay, and read that verse for me. And I kid you not right away. It's like, that's the wrong version. He's missing stuff out of the Bible in his hand. And we started to talk, and I preached the gospel to him and helped them understand. And, uh, you know, because this kid is searching for God, but he has the wrong Bible. Now, obviously, I, I don't think any of you are going to read the Joseph Smith Bible. We'll just set that aside. But you know how the devil's going to try to get you? He's going to try to tell you, well, you know, there's a new, there's the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Now they just call it the CSB. That's the Southern Baptist Bible. Or here is a MacArthur Study Bible. This is the ESV, the English Standard Bible. John MacArthur just wrote his own version of the Bible. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's called the Legacy Standard Bible. It changes the name of God. It deletes the deity of Jesus. It removes the blood. He doesn't believe the blood is necessary for salvation. John MacArthur says you can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. I mean, there's so many contradictions, right? Here's a third millennium Bible. They claim it's an update to the King James, but it's not. This is a new American Bible. This is the Messianic Jewish Family Bible. This is called an AV7, the authorized version, 7th edition. This is an NIV. Uh, if I had a new King James, it would still fall into this same category. Uh, what's something else? A new living translation, NLT. All of the other Bibles come from a different source. This is important. Here's what I want you to get. There's only two Bibles. What we call the King James. And I'm going to be honest with you for a second. I don't even like saying King James because it's not about that man. He was a man that God happened to use to answer a prayer of another man, right? Now, God loves men. He sends His Word through men. Holy men of God spake because they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The ghost writer is Jesus. But a series of Bibles in the preserved text was kept for us. There's only two Bibles. The same verses that are deleted are deleted in all of these, including the Jehovah's Witness Bible and the Seventh-day Adventist Bible. They all delete the same stuff. I want to tell you about the other side of the ledger. We have what's called the Authorized Version. It's called the Antioch Text. It's called the Textus Receptus, which means the majority text. There's 5,200 pieces of the Bible, that over 5,000 pieces that make this, where it's been documented throughout history. This is it. It all agrees, right? Sixty different men were used by King James, including himself, that oversaw and brought this together. Opposing religious groups were forced to work together so one couldn't slip in a doctrine over another. God really perfected His Word here. Not that He needed to perfect anything, but He perfected our language 
through the Word of God. What we have is awesome. It's powerful. It's perfect. There's no omissions. Everything we need to know, we can, we can get right here. This is the language of the world ever since the authorized version, the King James Bible. And again, I hate to say that it's not about King James, but you have to put a label so we know I'm not talking about one of these, okay? Yeah. Now, the flip side is two men called Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort. They used what was called the critical text. You have the majority. They were the minority. They were the critics of the majority. They criticized what was established. Today, the, uh, the UBS, Greek, which is, uh, what is it? Uh, United Bible Society. Is that right? Yeah, the United Bible Society, United Catholics and Muslims and Mormons, they all unite in this one thing. It's their Bible, the West Cotton Hort, versus the authorized version. Uh, the Nestle Island, it's also called. They have a different Greek. It's a different lineage. It's not from Antioch. It's from Alexandria. And I don't want to bore you, all right? I give you this because we're, tr we're called to try the spirits. You remember? All right, let's try it. We're called to... Try the spirits. Amen. All right, stay with me. This is important. There's two Bibles. We are a King James only. We prefer this. They are Westcott and Hort only. Let me tell you about these two men. Church of England Bishop Brooke Foss Westcott. He was a communist. Cambridge University professor Fenton John Anthony Hort. He was a Darwinist. Uh, they were not Christians. They did not believe the Son of God came in the flesh. They did not believe that there is a Son of God. Uh, uh, Luke mentioned it in Sunday school hour where, they where it says, the Son of God. They changed it to a Son of the gods because they believe in a plurality of spirits. They don't believe in a God representing Himself to man. They do not believe Jesus paid the sin atonement. They do not believe the Genesis account. They say Genesis 1 through 3 should be deleted from every Bible. They don't believe in hell. Uh, they don't believe that we have God's Word. These were the men that criticized the text to create a new Bible that became the foundation for everything else up on this side. Every one of them. And when I, I'm showing you a few, there's literally 400 variants, and they all have the same uh, source. Westcott and Hort. And they just simply pulled it out of uh, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the historical errors. These men taught it was okay to worship dead relatives. These men, Westcott and Hort, they, uh, uh, I believe it was Westcott, it says, his son said that Westcott would get up at 3 a.m. and he would come to the church and he would sit down in the pew and he would commune with the dead spirits. He would sit in a church that held 400 people and he said one by one these spirits would come and they would sit down with him and he would conversate with them. He would have a communication with them and these devils would come and talk to him. This is the man that, that translated the Bible. Now wait a minute. When somebody says an angel came to me and gave me a special message, we've only got a couple options. Either they're crazy and they have no business translating the Bible, right? Yeah. Or they're a charlatan, a false prophet trying to steal from people, a liar, and I wouldn't trust them to translate the Bible, would you? Or it really happened and these men were speaking with devils that gave them new doctrine so they would print a Bible that says Jesus is not God and he didn't die for all of your sins. Think about it. Try the spirits. Test the spirits. Are you a Berean? Will you search the Scriptures so that you know for yourself what's right and what's wrong? What's interesting, he, they taught it was okay to pray to Mary. There's no real heaven. Uh, Luke alluded to it this morning. Baptismal regeneration. That your spirit is regenerated when you go under the water. You have to baptize a baby so they can enter into the covenant of salvation. Babies can't choose to believe on Christ. That's, that's heresy, right? So there's no wonder they delete Acts 8.37. These guys practice what the Bible calls necromancy. Speaking to devils. They started three secret societies 
One was called the Hermes Club. The other was called the, the Ghostly Guild. They still exist today. It's Satanism. It's witchcraft. And that is the source of the men that translated the majority of the Bibles out there today. They wanted to commune with spirits. Now, I want to help you in this. You're still in 1 John. We're told to try the spirits, but brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes we need to try our own spirit. I'm here to tell you there's a ghost rider to the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you there's a ghost rider, if you will, to this NIV, it's the devil himself. Now it's amazing, there's still a lot of truth in here that is correct. However, there's this poisonous infection. You notice rat poison is not 99% poison, it's only 1% poison. Rat poison is 1% poison and that's enough to kill the rat because if he could smell the poison, he wouldn't eat it. If a Christian opened it and it says, it says Jesus is not God, wait a minute, this isn't the Bible. They would know right away, that's poison, get rid of it. Instead, it alludes to it and it waters it down and it dilutes it and it changes and it deletes the West Cotton Hort only movement is what the rest of the world has been swept away by. Reading a Bible that originated with two men that literally worked for Satan. Now you have the Word of God. He says in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. If you would, go to Romans chapter 8 real quick. Go to Romans chapter number 8. There are many people that have been deceived. And again, what was the source? Well, Satan gives this message to evil spirits. Evil spirits, in turn, give it to false prophets. False prophets take it to Unwilling, uh, unknowing or unsuspecting people, um, uh, unsuspecting followers that are just kind of receiving it, but they're not scripturally wise enough to recognize it as rat poison. Well, I want to make sure that we try the spirits, not just with the Word of God, but with our own self. Sometimes we get an idea. I know what I'll do. I'll go and do something. Do we ever stop to think, to pray, and say, Lord, am I being led by your spirit or am I just being selfish? We have the potential to sin. Does anybody disagree with that? No. Amen. We're saved. You still sin. So that old man is still with you, that sinful flesh, and you have your own spirit. And sometimes it's the flesh driving your spirit instead of letting the Holy Spirit drive your flesh. It's backwards. So what do we do? Romans 8, if you will, look at verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You will not be condemned. Listen, when we get to heaven, there's no condemnation anyway. But if you want a better life here, then you better follow the Holy Spirit, and there is no condemnation for breaking God's law while you're here. We have to choose spiritual power by submitting to God's will and His Word while we're here. Look at verse 4. He said that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God has given you the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you into truth, and we never stop and ask for directions. Who's had to stop and ask for directions lately? I did. You did this morning, didn't you, on the way here. Right. She, well, now get, correct me if I'm wrong. She pulls up to Halsema Food Store and says, where's Halsema Road? And they said, well, it's right there. I mean, amen. Now, now. We can laugh at her, but wouldn't it? Now, I laugh with her. I, well, I, we could laugh at her, but I would be the guy who sits in the parking lot looking at the sign, he'll see my food store and say, well, I'm not going to go in and ask for directions. I'm too embarrassed. <laughs> right? At least she said, I need to find out what's going on. I need to ask some directions here. Right? Now, think about it. You have God's Holy Spirit inside of you. Are you asking for directions? Are you saying, Lord, I'm about to make a big decision. I need to stop. I need to pray. I need to read your word. I need to fast if I need to fast and withhold food. So I know that I'm moving in the right direction. God wants us to ask for directions. How? We are trying our own spirit. We are still sinful flesh. We make bad decisions sometimes. I didn't get any amens on that. 
Hey, quit elbowing your husband, ma'am. I'm just kidding. All right, just joking. All right. Uh, <laughs> we all make bad decisions at times, don't we? And it's because we're not following the Holy Spirit. We're following our own spirit or the flesh as it refers to here. Look at verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh, they want to get the fleshly things, do mind the things of the flesh. They're thinking about earthly things. Verse 5, he says the end, he says, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Are you thinking about spiritual things in your mind? Verse 6, for to be carnally minded, that means fleshly minded, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Go to Galatians chapter 5. I want to help you test your own spirits. As we talk about scriptural authority and power, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you which will lead you and guide you into all truth. And we sometimes mind earthly things and selfish things. And we want to do what's best for us. And we're not thinking about God. How would you use me to serve others? Because I promise you this, no sooner than you realize my time, my talent, my treasure, my thoughts, my words, every one of them should be a gift used by God for others to demonstrate His love. When you start to see things, it's like, oh, I found a $100 bill. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this isn't for me. God's giving this to me as a test, and I want to try the Spirit. So let me see who I can give it to and say, God bless you. Right. Right. When we realize that I'm not taking any of this dirt with me, and we start to change our perspective and we say, God, what would you have me to do with all that you've given me? How can I honor you and bless you? Because I'll tell you what ruins families is a selfish spirit. I'll tell you what ruins lives is just being greedy and selfish and angry and bitter. That's not God's will for us. You're in Galatians 5. Look at verse 13. Galatians 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Liberty means freedom. He says, hey, you're free. Now that you have Christ, you're free in Christ. There's nothing you can do to lose it unless you mess it up for yourself. And he says, great, what am I free to do? Shall we continue in sin? Well, no, he says, God forbid, elsewhere. So what are we free to do? He says, by love serve one another. You understand that when you're in your own flesh and in your own spirit, you can only do selfish things. Even the world, when they, oh, well, I, I, I help people and I give money out. Don't you see me? They're doing it for their own pride. But I believe through the Holy Spirit, you can give and not let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. We use that in our family because my wife is left-handed. And sometimes I'll do stuff that she doesn't even know about because... Amen. You know, I mean, we ought to honor God with all that we have. And he says, we are free to love other people. Amen. You have the freedom, spiritually free, to show God's love in your life. This is God's will for you. You can do what the rest of the world cannot do. Look at the next verse in verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, we all know the verse and the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. I love this verse because in the eloquence of the Bible and in God's perfect words, he says the whole law, every law is filled in one word. And then he gives us half a sentence. Thou shalt. Thou is personal, individual. Thou shalt is a commandment. Love thy neighbor as thyself. The stingy people say, well, well, who is my neighbor anyway? Right? He summarized it in one word, love, but he gave us the application in a sentence. It's when you personally love the people that are next to you, close to you, beside you, that you happen to intersect paths with, when you show them the love of Christ in a way that it's only the Holy Spirit working through you, you have fulfilled all of God's laws. I mean, I know it says uh, not to steal. Right? And maybe you leave your phone, and I'm like, ooh, look at this phone. Oh, that's nice. I don't know whose it is. It could be mine. No, nope, no. Nope. I won't steal. I didn't break the law. Well, wait a minute. I broke the law when I coveted after it, didn't I? Right? Now, if I have, am filled with the Holy Spirit, and I say, well, wait a minute. That's somebody's. we got to find out before they leave so they don't have to spend extra gas coming back here and miss an important phone call. What do I need to do to serve this person and help them solve their problem? That's the Holy Spirit working through love. 
He says in the next verse, verse 15, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You know, that's what happens to most families, unfortunately. They're too selfish. They bite, they devour, they consume, they destroy. So what do we do? Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here's the goal. Choose to ask God every step of the way, am I making the right choice? Am I honoring you with my decisions? When we do that, the whole law is fulfilled, and we will not offend God or our brother. The problem is there's a war in our body. Look at the verse following in verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. He says contrary, that means opposite. He's saying we're at enmity. It's an enemy. It's like two magnets that are forcing each other away. It's like, I want to do the right thing, but my body doesn't. We have this constant battle, and we need to ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit, we need to obey Him and fill our mind with the Holy Scriptures that I might not sin against Thee. And then we can have true spiritual power on our life. And as He said in verse 16, to walk in the Spirit. Jump down to verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. There it is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. God's will is that we'd work for Him. Go back to John 4, 1 John 4. God's will is that we could demonstrate love in a supernatural way that's beyond our own capacity, that when you're done doing what you're doing and somebody says, man, that person, I just, I don't know how they do it. They would probably say, I need God's help every day. I need God's Word every day. I need to preach to myself every day. God's will is is that we would demonstrate His love while we're here. And here's the thing. We have to try the spirits, whether they be of God. You get it. I'm convinced. I'm going to do something. It's like, wait a minute. Hold on. Is that of God? Or am I, have I allowed, have I given place to the devil in my life to make a bad decision where I'm just going to be selfish or hurt somebody or be angry or bitter? God forbid. Allow me to submit to the will of God. He says in verse 4, we're back in 1 John 4. Look at verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. The world, is li the world lieth in wickedness. It's full of false prophets. They're deceivers. They want to hurt people. And God says, that's okay. What's inside of you, God's Spirit by faith, is greater than everything the world has to offer. He says, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Well, now wait, what's speaking of the world? Hey guys, let me tell you, you guys, you, who likes Lamborghinis? Let's talk about that. Hey, how about that football game? Let's talk about that. Oh, I got your ears perked up now. Right, that's of the world. We're speaking of the world. We're speaking of fleshly things. You know what I love is when you start talking to somebody and they've got a Bible verse to go along with what you're talking about and draw you back toward Christ instead of letting you go away and go toward the world. They are of the world, right? Verse 6, we are of God. And now, how are we of God? Because we've trusted Jesus, that He is God, and He paid for our sins, He puts the Holy Spirit inside of you to guide you. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There's your fake news. You have your own little radar. Do -do 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 -do. You can check it out. Oh, that's fake news. That's spirit of error. How do I know? Because it goes against God. Beloved, verse 7. Uh, you know, we sing the Psalms, and I, I know we're trying to get them integrated. We have a lot of little Psalm books. We need to print some more. This is one of the ones that I love, and uh, it says, Make a joyful noise. I know my voice isn't that beautiful, but these next two verses, I love to sing. He says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. 
Beloved, let us love one another, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Man, I love that. I need that. I need that in my heart. I love to sing it because it reminds me that God loves me so much. I am a broken person. I am a sinner just like you. And God inhabits me for one purpose, and that's to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can show that through love. There are people that don't deserve love, and God says, you love them anyway. Right, right. But God, we ought to, they need, God says, you don't deserve it. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, that's the world, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Say, how can I test the spirits? How can I test myself? Are you loving somebody else? Is that your motivation? Everything in your life. If you say, I, I have young children, and it's a lot of hard work. I was talking to somebody this week, and they said, uh, we're only going to have two because I was one of four, and then my parents got remarried, and there was three more. And I tell you why, when it's us, there's nothing but chaos, and we're only going to have two. And I said, buddy, I'm going to encourage you to have as many as you can because your family should not just be some sort of side gig that rides along with your career or your plan for building a mansion. That's the whole deal. God chose you to raise up souls to live for Him. Yes. How can I try the spirits to see if I'm of love? Do you understand that the marriage relationship is the picture of God loving His bride? We're the bride. We're the ones that believe in Him. And God would never hurt His bride. And you men, we got to understand in the flesh, sometimes we're just some hard-headed brute beasts. Here's a Bible word. We're hard-headed animals. You understand that the marriage relationship is a gift of love. But we have the flesh. We go after the flesh. We speak of the world. How can I demonstrate this, that God is love? How can I try the spirits to make sure I'm moving in the right direction? If you look at verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. He wants to give you eternal life, but most people have not heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's on us. That's uh, to our shame, right? Verse 10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Full payment. Propitiation. Complete sacrifice. When Jesus died for the sins of the world, He died for all of your sins, even the ones you haven't stopped, even the ones you're going to do tomorrow. He already paid for it. Now that's true love. I don't deserve that. He gave it to me. Now that I hold this, it says from faith to faith, I hold this perfect, beautiful gift of eternal life. And he says, why don't you love somebody else and tell them that God is love? Everybody wants to focus on hell. Why? Because they're afraid of going there. Don't focus on that. Say, hey, let me tell you this. All I know is I've been forgiven. Jesus loved me so much, he took my hell. He paid for hell. He paid for everything. It's done. It's finished. All I have to do is trust in him. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. He says that ought to be your reputation. That ought to be your lifestyle, that you're known for loving other people. Nothing else. I'm a computer nerd. That shouldn't be my reputation. I make videos. I shouldn't be known for that. All the other skills that God's given me, it all comes to this one point that I can use it to cross paths with people so I can say, hey, you know what? God is love. You know how much love He is? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. He says in verse 12, No man has seen... Actually, jump down to verse 15 and let's finish up. Look at verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. We're in God by faith. God is in us by faith. It's beautiful. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. 
And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. That's the Holy Spirit. Friends, I tell you this morning, I just want to encourage you in this. You need to try the spirits. You need to test the spirits. If you don't have a King James Bible, get one. It's not about King James. In the back, I have these little flash drives. Somebody mailed them. They're free. It's got the whole audio Bible. Just plug it into your car. Plug it into your computer. It's got the whole Bible and a Word document. You can read it. It's got a program you can install that will, you can search the scriptures and play it and do all sorts of neat stuff. Totally free. Back there in the back. Take them. A free gift, just like salvation. I want you to understand. We've, he says in verse 16, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Do you understand that part of the gospel is believing in the love of God? That He loved us so much. What did He do, John 3.16? For God. Who wants to quote John 3.16 for me? Josiah. For God so loved the world. Amen. Anybody. All you have to do is believe. And then... You won't perish. You won't go to hell. That's true love. Look at verse 17. We'll finish. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. You know what it means in boldness in the day of judgment? Have you ever, have you ever had to stand before a judge? Raise your hand if you've ever had to stand before a judge. About half the room. Uh, I'll tell them myself real quick. I got arrested one time for resisting arrest. No joke. I did a television show and I was out recording. Back in the day, if you guys remember, when Chick-fil-A had their like, we're standing up against the weirdos and we're just going to do it the right way. And so everybody came to support them. And I said, well, I'm going to take my camera down there and I'm going to support them too. And I'll film it and I'll put it on TV and all like that. And they didn't like it. Well, it wasn't Chick-fil-A. It was the cops that were there. And they're like, you got to get out of here. And I'm like, I'm not doing anything wrong. There's Channel 3 and there's Channel 5. And it's just little old me. You know, you leave me alone. Well, the cops got mad. And they ended up throwing me to the ground and everything. And, and you know, I wish I could say I'd done everything right. But I didn't do anything wrong. I, didn't, I mean, I, I wasn't trespassing. I was, you know. And, and so they're like, well, what are we going to arrest this guy for? We broke his camera. He's bleeding. He's on the ground. His, his shirt ripped. I know. We'll arrest him for resisting arrest. And when it came time, I stood before the judge and I said, I'm ready for trial. I've got the footage. I know I'm right. I'm re Let's go to trial. Let's not waste any time. I was bold in that day because I knew I was not guilty, right? Now, when he tells us, look at this in verse, this is so important in verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. On the day that you stand before your Creator, when you get there, why should I let you in? What if God said that? What could you say? Oh, I've been good, and I went to church, and I turned it around, and I quit this, and I started that. No, no, no. None of that will do. The boldness in the day of judgment is I can stand before God, and I can say, you promised in your word, if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be saved, and all my sins have been forgiven. I have boldness in that day of judgment because I have nothing to fear. He paid for it all. I know I'm imperfect, but while I'm here, boy, I want to live for Him and look like Him. Don't you? Look at the next verse, verse 18. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So what ought we to do? Well, if I love, he, what do he say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Now that we're saved by faith, we have the Holy Spirit. He, he's trying to give us some instruction. Show the love. How do I do that? Verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. He's not just saying, love your kin. He's saying, love the other people around you, especially have love for fellow Christians. You know how Satan destroys churches? Gossip, hatred, strife, bitterness. He wants to get that root down in your heart. You know how Satan destroys marriages? If you're not showing brotherly love from spouse to spouse, you've failed the most basic commandment. All 
all of the commandments are fulfilled in this one word. Love your spouse better than yourself. Love. Love. How can I try the spirits to see if they're of God? Well, God loved you. He forgave you. Shouldn't we do the same for our brothers and sisters, especially in Christ? I want to encourage you. You have the Bible. You have the right Bible. You're not standing on the West Cotton Hort crowd. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. God's will is that you would be a witness of love, a testimony of selflessness. What can I do to help someone else? When we do that, we fulfill the love of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Oh Lord, thank You for loving us and being merciful. Lord, no one in here can say, I deserve heaven. I've been good enough. Lord, we're all found guilty. We all fall short. And Lord, we need Your saving power. Lord, thank You for being merciful to us and giving us the gift of grace. Lord, I pray that if there's any in here that are not saved, You would prick their heart and help them trust in You. Lord, if there's any in here that are dealing with strife in their family right now, that You would help them to love as You did and turn the other cheek. Lord, I pray that as we leave here this afternoon, Lord, I, I pray that You would help us to preach the Gospel in a way that would change lives. Lord, as we now eat together, I just ask that You would bless the food. But more important than that, I ask that You would bless our spirit to honor You. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.